morning. Welcome to Community Unitarian Universalist Congregation at White Plains, New York, on land formerly of the Lenape Nation. I'm Karen Leahy, your worship associate this morning. The mission of our congregation is to nurture each other in our spiritual journeys, foster compassion and understanding within and beyond our community, and engage in service to transform ourselves and our world. And our vision is that our congregation will be a welcoming sanctuary without walls that promotes diversity, fellowship, spiritual growth, and inspiration, while committing to people and the planet through social action and service. I welcome you to this home of liberal religion, five tenets of which are, revelation is continuous. Relations must rest on free consent, not hierarchical authority. We have a moral obligation to build just and loving community. We cannot be good without good institutions and transformation is possible. Last Tuesday was the summer solstice, and so today is our first Sunday of summer. We're appropriately hot for the first Sunday of summer, and you will notice all around the county that gardens are really beginning to put forth their little tomatoes, their little beans, their little everything. This is a season of production, of plenty, of, of showing what plenty will look like. A special welcome to our visitors. We're honored to have you with us. If you're new today in our, and here in our sanctuary, we invite you to wave a hand so that we can recognize you. Anybody, there's some new people? <laughs> Hi, back there. Yeah, and welcome you. If you are new online today, please introduce yourself in the chat. Those online may find a link to the order of service on our website at cucwp.org. If you have a joy, sorrow, or milestone you'd like to share, you may write it in our Joys and Sorrows book back there in the corner beyond that beautiful sculpture. For those of you at home, please enter it into the chat. Please make the first joy word on the chat, joy, sorrow, or milestone, so that at the end of the prayer, we will know which chat entries are meant for us to speak aloud. Our, we are very proud today to have as our preacher and worship leader, Reverend Lane Cobb, whose proud parents are here in the congregation. Come on, yay! <laughs> our, our longtime members, Jane and Mary and Jim. And Lane is a graduate of our RE program. She is now an author, coach, and ordained interfaith interspiritual minister committed to educating and uplifting those seeking to live a more authentic, spirit-filled life. With over 25 years of coaching experience, she is an expert in the fields of transformation, motivation, and healing, and provides a safe space for people to envision, create, and fulfill on individual and collabor co collaborative projects. Known for her inclusive leadership style, Lane inspires people to speak their truth and empower themselves without disempowering others. Her virtual platform, Race Talk Revolution, provides a courageous and loving space for people of all backgrounds to discuss the nuances of systemic racism, share their experiences, and promote anti-racist ideals and actions. She is committed to elevating the social conscience her goal is to provide a safe space where every voice is heard, every voice is appreciated, and every voice matters. Okay, I'm back. Um, <laughs> on the first Sunday of the season, we dedicate our chalice to the first principle of our faith, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, every being. Please join with me in the chalice lighting words from Albert Schweitzer in your order of service and on the screen. At times, you want light? our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us.
Thank you, Karen. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, CUC White Plains. So glad to be here. Uh, I am so honored. Um, I'm honored to be leading your annual Juneteenth service this morning. Um, today we're going to do some learning and we're going to do some celebrating and also some journeying together. Um, thank you, John Chimbo and Kazi Oliver, for coming from Peekskill this morning to uh, lend us your talent um, and your spirit. Juneteenth is a time for celebration and reflection. Uh, we celebrate the freeing of an enslaved people in 1865. We celebrate the possibility of new beginnings in this country. We also reflect on our troubling history, uh, but also on the essential contributions that African Americans, both enslaved and free, have made to America. Today, um, we're going to invoke the spirit of our ancestors because that is also a traditional um, expression of people of color um, and indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, we're going to reflect on our, uh, the value of our common journey and celebrate the bond that we all share. May the spirit of a universal and a benevolent God bless this gathering this morning. Amen. Please join me in watching this short video about the history of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, short for June 19th, is the day commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. It's a holiday that has been celebrated since 1866 and represents a critical turning point in American history. Open up a classroom history book and the author might say that slavery ended on January 1st, 1863. The day when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it established that all enslaved people in the Confederate States in the rebellion against the Union shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. Of course, the proclamation stated this, but it did not instantly free any enslaved people. It would take another two years for slavery to end in the United States. In Texas, slavery continued uninterrupted during the Civil War. The state wasn't involved in large-scale battles and there wasn't a real presence of Union troops. Two months after the war came to a close, U.S. General Gordon Granger arrived on Texas soil and read General Order No. 3. The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Granger's arrival marked the freedom for 250,000 enslaved people in the state. Although emancipation didn't happen overnight, celebrations broke out among newly freed black people. Juneteenth was born. The following year, freed people in Texas organized the first of what became the annual celebration of Jubilee Day on June 19th. The holiday wasn't widely celebrated across the country, but the traditions continued to grow over the next several decades. By 1979, Texas became the first state to make Juneteenth an official holiday. Finally, in June 2021, Congress passed a resolution establishing Juneteenth as a national holiday. And now we take you live to the East Room of the White House, where President Biden is going to sign the law making Juneteenth a national holiday. All right. Juneteenth marks a date of major significance in American history. It's the longest tradition of celebrating the emancipation of thousands of enslaved people who forcibly worked and lived in inhumane conditions. The two-year march from when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed to the arrival of troops in Texas is a metaphor for the many ways in which freedoms for black people have been delayed in this country. Today, the holiday is a way to acknowledge past faults, help heal current divisions, and move toward a future of a more perfect union. gathering hymn this morning is number 10 there's a river flowing in my soul 
The hymn was written by Faya Rose Touré, born Rose Sanders in 1945. She left behind her slave name in 2003, choosing the West African name Faya Touré. She is an attorney and civil rights activist in Alabama, and in 1973, she became the first female African-American judge in that state. In addition, she's written over 40 plays and 200 songs, exploring themes of community, engagement, and social awareness. Please rise as you are able and join me in singing, There's a River Flowing in My Soul. Good morning again. So upon uh, entering the sanctuary this morning, you should have received or may have received a piece of kente cloth. Kente cloth has historical and cultural significance to people of African descent. The colors that is, is sometimes called is worn to symbolize wisdom, strength, accomplishment, and solidarity with African culture. As, a typical, uh, as is typical of African culture, each aspect of its aesthetic design is intended as communication. The colors of the cloth each hold symbolism. Gold stands for status as well as serenity. Yellow is for fertility. Green is for renewal. Blue for pure spirit and harmony. Red symbolizes passion, and black symbolizes union with our ancestors and our spirituality and our spiritual awareness. So this morning, I invite you to don that piece of kente cloth as a symbol of your connection to the African diaspora and our purpose for being here this morning. 
to celebrate a piece of our collective American history and the particular history of African Americans. Likewise, I invite us to pass the peace this morning with a phrase that's familiar to many of us here in this sanctuary. The word salam is an Islamic word that literally means peace. During the civil rights era, young black Americans, in particular those embracing the black power movement, adopted the traditional Islamic greeting, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum was the standard salutation among members of the Nation of Islam, which featured prominently in the Black Power era. Walaikum salam, meaning and unto you peace, was the, was the um, traditional response. Pardon me. Common in the Arab world, the greeting was one of the few linguistic conventions of Eastern or Orthodox Islam that the nation retained in its original Arabic form. The Muslim practice of hailing fellow Muslims and others with assalamu alaikum mirrored the, traditional, uh, the tradition in popular black culture of swapping evocative and expressive salutations such as what's happening. Assalamu alaikum. It is also a common phrase among Arab, Arabic speakers or other religions such as Arab Christians and Mizrahi Jews. So today I invite us all to pass the peace with the phrase assalamu alaikum. And I want everybody, please, let's practice. Assalamu alaikum. The response is walaikum assalam. Or you may simply say salam. Pass the peace. Salam, indeed. <laughs> Plus, I think I'm missing out. <laughs> We begin with the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some more convenient season. It is today that our best work can be done and not some future day or future year. It is today that we fit ourselves for the greater usefulness of tomorrow. Today is the seed time. Now are the hours of work and tomorrow comes the harvest and the playtime. Come, let us pray. At this time, we open our hearts to all people of the world who are suffering the effects of war or hunger or injustice or natural disaster. We hold in our hearts those among us here who have joys to celebrate or whose hearts are heavy. We observe now 60 seconds of silence.
So we're going to pour libation this morning. Libation is a, liter uh, um, a ritual pouring. And I'm just going to say that I am, for some reason, I haven't been this nervous about doing a sermon, and I don't know when. I'm not sure why. But I'm just going to own that up, because I might just say a lot of more ums and errs and oopses. So forgive me for all of those. Thank you for flowing with me this morning. So pouring libations, uh, people of color have been pouring libations for centuries. Um, it is traditional among indigenous folks and people of color. It has been adopted um, by different cultures throughout the globe. As we know, water is um, considered to be a spiritual, um, it's a conduit for spirit and is used in many, many religious and spiritual ceremonies, so this is not different. Um, among other things, pouring libations is done to pay homage to our ancestors, um, and it is also used as an affirmation for our journey, for a desired outcome. Uh, so today we're going to pour water to give honor and light to our ancestors, every one of us here in the sanctuary and at home. Um, it's an opportunity for us to uh, invite the spirit of our ancestors to worship with us, but also to give them gratitude for the, for the opportunity to stand on their shoulders, for the journey that they have endured so that we can be who we are and where we are right now in time. Um, so the way this works, I'm gonna say a brief prayer, and then I'm just gonna invite all of us to uh, say the name of an ancestor, one or more, or an ascended master whom you um, particularly admire or identify with. Uh, once all the names have been said, we're going to close out our ritual uh, with the word ashe. And ashe is a word from the African Yoruba language, and it is similar to the word amen. It is an af affirmation. It means, and so it is, if you will. All righty. So after the, uh, one of the things that we do is once we say the name of the ancestor, I pour water, so I will continuously pour water into this bowl. That is, that is symbol, symbolize the spirit is present, okay? That we are giving homage to that person. Great spirit, we invite you to be with us this morning. We invite you and the ascended masters and all who have loved and who have lived to share our wisdom with us this morning. Please come, be with us, guide us. We know that, please know how grateful we are for your presence in our lives. Please know how grateful we are for the lessons that you have taught and the journey that you have walked. I call on the Ascended Masters, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Ella Baker, Harriet Tubman. I call on my personal ancestors, A.J. Griffin, Ophelia Griffin, David A. Lane, Juanita Bobson, Mary Webb, please recite names of your ancestors as I pour the water. Please call them out. Loudly, we want them to hear us, loudly. Ashe. 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 Anyone else? Everybody come. Everybody come. Everybody come. Wonderful. And in the names of all of those spirits whose names have been spoken and unspoken, we express our gratitude and our love. Thank you for being with us. You are welcome here. Thank you for walking with us. And we all say, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Believe in freedom cannot 
I'd like to begin my sermon this morning with, by reading a poem by Courtney Lamar Charleston. It's called, I'm Rooting for Everybody Black. Everybody Black is my hometown team. Everybody Black dropped the hottest album of the year. Easy. Everybody Black is in this show, so I'm watching. Everybody Black is in this movie. So I'm watching. Everybody Black wore it better. Tell the truth. Everybody Black's new book was beautiful. How you don't know about Everybody Black? Everybody Black, mad underrated. Everybody Black reminds me of somebody I know. I love seeing Everybody Black succeed. I hope Everybody Black gets elected. Everybody black deserves the promotion more than anybody. I want everybody black to find somebody special because everybody black is good people. Everybody black been through some things. Everybody black don't get the credit they're due. I met everybody black once and they were super chill and down to earth. I believe in everybody black. There's something about everybody black. So I've been speaking quite a bit already this morning, so this sermon is not going to be long. I'd like to begin again by thanking everybody for being here and thanking Reverend Garman for inviting me to take this pulpit this morning. 
I'd like to begin also by talking very briefly about the Juneteenth flag that you see there in the upper right hand corner. And if you don't know this already, I invite you to look this up in more detail this afternoon. As I invite you to look up the more details about the symbolism of kente cloth and pouring libations. The Juneteenth flag symbolizes freedom and justice for African Americans. It's been flying since 1997. The red, white, and blue colors of the flag are similar to the United States flag to remind us that African Americans are and always have been American, even throughout their enslavement. The black community is one with America, and the colors chosen furthers the notion that America must ensure that all citizens have access to liberty and justice for all. The star is another call back to the United States flag, but it also symbolizes Texas, the Lone Star State, where the final liberation occurred. The burst around the star symbolizes a nova, a new beginning for African Americans, and the arc represents the new horizon of opportunities that are to come for black people following the end of slavery. The symbol of Sankofa is on the lower left-hand side, and Sankofa is an African word from the Akan tribe in Ghana. The literal translation of the word and the symbol is, it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. The word is derived from the words san, which means return, ko, which means go, and fa, look or seek and take. The Sankofa symbolizes the quest for knowledge among the Akan people with the implication that the quest is based on critical examination and intelligent and patient investigation. The symbol is based on a mythical bird, as you can see, with the feet firmly planted forward with its head turned backwards. Thus, the Akan believe the past serves as a guide for planning the future. To the Akan, it is this wisdom in learning from the past which ensures a strong future. The Akans believe that there must be movement and new learning as time passes. As this forward march proceeds, the knowledge of the past must never be forgotten. And that is what I want to talk with us about today. I don't have to tell you that American history is given in part to a white supremacist agenda based on and supported by a false racial, social, and gender-based hierarchy that continues to dictate policies and behaviors that negate the lived experience of black and brown Americans and pits American citizens against each other for a fight, in a fight for legitimacy. While some Americans would wish to forget this troubled past by reframing history in their favor, they perpetuate the status quo of traditional white American culture there are others pushing not only for us to remember America's history as it really happened, but also to legitimize the lived experience of black and brown Americans through reparations and other forms of atonement. Looking through the lens of Sankofa, we the citizens of America would understand the importance of looking back and learning from our mistakes. We would value the process of examining our lived experience to locate the lessons that we may have missed so that we may use them in the present for the benefit of a better, stronger future for our people. And by this, I mean all our people, black people, white people, all people. Typically, a Juneteenth service will focus on one or more aspects of black history in America. And truly, the value of Juneteenth um, is to reflect not only on the lived experience of black Americans, but on their essential contributions to our nation. And I hope that. Um, on the occasion of Juneteenth, which was last uh, Sunday, we all took a pause to celebrate and support and uplift both the memory of black folk, but also to spend our time and our money supporting black folk, because indeed it is vitally important to reflect on the true history of our country and be an action to atone and repair relationships and push against oppressive systems that subjugate, at this point, most of us Americans, but especially black and brown people. Today I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, though. Today I'm going to invite us to journey together to a time before America even existed. It's been said that black history is American history, and I certainly agree with this statement. What I want us to consider this morning is that black history is everybody's history. Regardless of where we live in the world, 
by virtue of us just being alive. Our shared history is based not only in our lived experience, but in our shared ancestry. Many of you will remember that in 1974, archaeologists discovered in Ethiopia the fossilized remains of an Australopithecus afarensis, a species of hominin that lived nearly 3.2 million years ago and is thought to be a human ancestor. Lucy, as she was named. She walked primarily on two legs and offers key insights into our possible, if not probable, human origins. By studying the contours of Lucy's mostly complete skull, scientists deduced that modern humans and Lucy's contemporaries shared a similar developmental timeline. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to suggest that there are not a lot of origin theorists listening to me talk this morning. I could be wrong and I apologize. But having said that, I'm also going to say uh, something that may sound radical to some people, but it, it, to many of you liberal thinkers, I think probably not so radical at all. If Lucy is our human ancestor, and we are all human, and I think we can agree that we are, then Lucy is our shared ancestor. We all basically come from her and her people. Her ancestor lineage is our ancestral lineage. Lucy's remains found in Africa. We know that black people originated in Africa, which means, beloved, that everybody is black. Science does not dispute this. It has been shown that other races evolved from the migration of ancient Africans, despite the ridiculous racial classifications and of uh, early anthropologists and the ignorance of modern race theorists. We all truly come from the same place, hence the term Mother Africa, where it is largely assumed that life as we know it began. So I'd like you to look at the people in this room with you today and consider the history that you share. If you're love streaming, please do this with your loved ones at home. I'd like you to look a little deeper than the surface. Maybe you know that you share a common ancestor, your aunts, your uncles, your mothers, your fathers. But I want you to find that place in your heart that understands how far back the connection really goes. Back before we as a species had language, we all sat around a common fire. And back before we had fire, we sat together in the dark. Earlier in the service, we invoked the spirit of our ancestors. Let us now notice how far back the ancestral line goes. By this time, we've learned how closely related we all are. 23andMe has shown us this. We've seen how fragile our notion of self can be and how easily it can be challenged. The ancestors of slaves and slaveholders connect on a regular basis these days. We, we continue to deal with ourselves and our history. We have also seen how harmful the concept of tribalism can be, especially when our tribe is defined by a limited set of beliefs that exclude anyone who doesn't see the world the same way. Tribe is a construct designed for survival, but tribalism is not useful in our time when the survival of our very planet is at stake. How might our need for tribalism shift if we consider the depth of connection to each other and to the earth and specifically to the continent of Africa, where life itself began and where we now, sitting here together, are the evolved offspring of a single mother, just maybe. What if instead of tribalism, we practice the art of Sankofa? Would there be some benefit, perhaps, of purposefully looking back as far as we can to find out who we truly are, not just as a people, but as people connected in every way? Could we perhaps transcend a painful past, not by ignoring it or removing ourselves from it, but by drawing closer to it? What if we took on, even for a single day, if not the fact, at least the concept of universal blackness? Would it make a difference in our activism? Would we pay greater attention to what was happening in the world? Would we care more deeply 
and act with greater urgency? Might it be easier for us not only to understand and empathize with the lived experience of black Americans, but also to advocate more strongly on their behalf, as we would perhaps advocate for a distant cousin on our mother's side, many times removed, but still family? Would we be more open to the concept of reparations? Free education for the descendant of slaves, reduced income tax, reduced interest rates, just as examples. If those of us who identify as white or Asian or Latinx could remember, albeit through a deepening of our spiritual and emotional awareness, the, the roots we all share as humans, might that change how we see each other? Might we not take a step back from the up, us against them scenario that many of us have bought into and see that the real war we've been fighting is us against us and thereby invite a new paradigm of relationship. Might the paradigm be humanity instead of money, holism instead of hierarchy, might we be more open to the concept of reparations, as I said, and push for it? Because that would really make a difference. In the spirit of Sankofa, can we go back and get what is at risk of being left behind? The experience of universal family, the experience of indigeneity, of connection to earth and to spirit and to universal abundance for all? Can we connect to the cell memory of the experience of our ancient ancestors and bring forth the ancient wisdom that abides in our bodies but have been pushed to the side? What if we made it a practice to gather once again around the fire in the spiritual presence of our ancestors and the actual presence of each other? And what if we listened to each other speaking until there were no more words to be said, and then sat together around the fire until the fire goes out. So this morning, I invite us to sit at the virtual fire. Our ancestors are here with us now. We invited them in. They are all here in this room. And if you're love streaming, they are at home with you. They are in the ethers. They are here. Indeed, they are everywhere and anywhere we are. And as we contemplate our history, I invite us to pay homage to the ancestors we share as a species. I invite us to imagine that before we were Americans, before we were Europeans or Asians, we were Africans. Before we were white or yellow or brown, we were black. Let us travel to ancient Africa, right here. Let us smell the seawater and the rich, fertile soil. Let us feel the moist air, maybe a breeze. Hear the soft beating of the drums calling you to sit in circle with your relatives. They call to you. Come, sit, be with us. We have missed you. You've been too long away. We welcome you home.
Ni hao. Namaste. Como esta? Como esta? Assalamu alaikum. Akwaba. Konnichiwa. I just said hello to you all seven different languages. My name is Baba Kazi Oliver, African drummer extraordinaire. And right now, I'm going to do a magic trick, not a magic trick, a magic experience for all of you. And you are the people who want to do the magic. Right now, this is in a celebratory moment right now. We're celebrating something that's historical. And it's a long time waiting, you know, for us all to have this wonderful experience, for us to come together, quote unquote, as human beings. I'm honored to be here today, and I thank you, Sister Carl, for inviting me here. And I also thank Sister Petra Toms for who gave her my information. Some of you may have seen or heard me before in the past. Some of you may have not. I guarantee you, none of you will forget me after today. <laughs> I thank God for that part. Okay, everybody say, ya yeah, ya. Yeah. Saliman. Ya ya. Saliman. Eh, Madara. Sabo Sabale. Eh, Madara. Sabo Sabale. Now you know the words of the song. Now we're going to sing that song. It's called Response. And it's really what we're going to play. It's called Yankee. Courtship and also Unity. It's a combination. It's a song from Guinea, West Africa. I learned some years ago on my trips to Africa. I've yet to have to record it. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? It's called Response. Ya ya Salimam, Ya ya Salimam, Sabuni Mala, Ebadara, Ebadara, Sabu Sabu, Sabu Sabu, Ya ya Salimam, Ya ya Salimam, Sabuni Mala, Sabuni Mala, Ebadara, Ebadara, Sabu Sabu. Yeah, yeah, Sammy, man! Yeah, yeah, Sammy, man! 
you. Thank you so much. I have a number of announcements. We're still a busy congregation in the summer. At 12.30 today, if people are interested, we will host a community viewing of the Sunday worship live stream from the UUA General Assembly. If you would like to attend, please see Terry Kung after service and let her know. She's back there in that corner. This will help us know whether to set up or not, either in the sanctuary or in Fellowship Hall. You can also view the live stream from home. The link is uua.org. The Meals for Hope team will preparing, be preparing food in the CUC kitchen tomorrow from 10 to 2, and they can always use extra hands. If you can help, please see Scott Damashek or Steve Miller or show up. <laughs> the Refugee Resettlement Social Justice team is seeking a car for an Afghan family of four that we helped to resettle earlier this year. Contact Jane Dixon if you can help. We are also forming a new CUUC children's playgroup so families with young children can stay connected. You can contact Diane Keller or Tracy Brenneman to learn more. In June, half our non-pledge collection goes to Westchester Community College Foundation Student Emergency Fund, which promotes and supports the students at risk of dropping out due to emergency expenses, allowing those students to continue in school and complete their degrees. You can use the donate button on our website, the QR code on your paper order of service, or make a check out to CUUC with the memo, share the plate, WCC. We have an announcement from Jeff Tomlinson. Is he? Right oh, there you are. <laughs> Snuck right up on you. Good morning. Um, Reverend Meredith, uh, while out at uh, the, uni the UUA General Assembly, uh, reached out to the Social Justice Coordinating Committee and asked me to make this announcement and an invitation to the congregation. Based on the events of this last week in the Supreme Court, um, we, we invite the congregation to think about the formation of a reproductive rights um, social justice team um, this, this, you know, this summer and uh, throughout the next couple of years. Um, if anyone is interested in being a part of that social justice team, um, you can contact myself, um, Mary Cavallaro, or even the administrator, uh, Pamela Parker, and let, let us know that you're interested in forming such a team. Uh, our rule is a rule of five. We need five people to start a social justice team, and, but we encourage the congregation to really take this seriously as an onslaught on, on people's rights, on women's rights. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We are accepting requests for next year's Share the Plate recipients. You will find forms and instructions in the lobby. See Mary Cavallaro if you have any questions. And we remind all New Yorkers to vote in the statewide primary elections next Tuesday. This is more important than ever. You can also vote early, even today in Westchester. Visit vote, vote411.org to learn more. Tracy? Our closing hymn is number 116, I'm On My Way. The version of the song in our hymnal is a civil rights era adaptation of an older slave song, I'm On My Way to Canaan Land. During the time of the Underground Railroad, Canaan was a code word for Canada, and some singing this song might have been signaling to others that they were going to run soon. The verse, I ask my sibling to come and go with me, takes on a whole new meaning with the original context in mind, as does, if they say no, I'll go anyhow. The work to, f to get free sometimes demands personal risk and a willingness to go when your kin won't be going with you. We're singing just a few verses of the song, so we'll follow along with the lyrics on the video, of Alina Hemingway, 
Please rise as you are able and join me in singing, I'm on my way. standing. Let's express our appreciation for today's musicians, Kazi Oliver, John Chimbo. <laughs> and for our guest worship leader, Lane Cobb. <laughs> now please join me in the chalice extinguishing words printed in your order of service and on the screen. We extinguish our chalice and the spark of divinity that recognizes the worth and dignity of all beings we carry with us now into the world. So I invite us to carry this experience with us into the world, to consider what is possible in the spirit of Sankofa. When we look back and learn and retrieve what has been forgotten and embrace all that we know towards the building of a better future. As we go forth into the world, let us consider the possibility that our common roots go much, much deeper than we realize. Let us embrace that new awareness and perhaps share it with those we love and trust. Let us continue to celebrate our victories and learn from our mistakes. And as we appreciate our common ancestral roots, let us embody the ancient wisdom of our ancestors into our daily lives. And let us look courageously at who we have been and allow our historical memory to be sharpened even as the love of a universal God gives us courage and grace to treat everyone we meet like family. Go in power, go in peace, and if my drummers would like to drum one more piece for us, it would be welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. Celebration. 
Come on! 